I want to talk about this, this, uh, the real, right? So we have, this is why I think it was so appropriate to, well, obviously to speak to you, but also to talk about why you draw on horror. So uh, for this book, because, you know, in horror, I'm, I'm going to probably not say this correctly, but, uh, there's this sense that you're, that reality as you understood it to be is not, there's instances in horror where you see something so horrifying, but it's actually the real. It is actually how reality is. Like, I think a good example of this is H.P. Lovecraft, which of course you draw in, in, in uh, the horror of police. But you know, it, it's incomp- it's almost incomprehensible for human minds to understand what reality actually is, what underlies all the systems that we have to make sense of and to order the world so that we can stay sane use quotation sane around that right um and then there's you know what eugene thacker you quote in the book he says you know either i do not know the world or i do not know myself both of those are are horrifying to consider Mm -hmm. um and with policing you apply this concept could you talk about what is it about policing that you know (laughs) <laughs> you know, brings up this subject of the real. Yeah. So, you know, you can kind of look at just the everyday way, the ways we might look at the police. So, you know, they're there for our benefit. They uh, you know, fight crime and enforce our laws. That might be one way to look at it. Uh, you could be a little bit more critical and talk about their history and how they, you know, uh, grew into uh, you know, what they are today, first and foremost, to you know, protect the property rights of wealthy people and, and, and the, including uh, black slaves in you know, southern plantation colonies, things of that nature. So we can look at those things more more uh, critically. But then, you know, what I try to get at in the book and and kind of this is the the core of what I was trying to actually understand myself is there's there's something else behind the police that if we understand it, we can also understand a little bit more about the world we live in. And our participation in producing that world. And when I say world, I'm I'm kind of thinking ontologically, like our nature of ourselves in the world we inhabit. And so the best way I can maybe explain this um, is during the like just after the the George Floyd um, case became public. I always say case murder became public and was on the news. And I went to visit a family member, and and um, you know we're speaking about just generally the weather and what's on TV and mm-hmm. that ca- that came up. And this is a person that knows nothing about police, but watches the news mm-hmm. a lot. And she said, you know, this is an 80 year old woman. She said, uh, you know, so much worse than all the others and his poor mother. Right. So mm-hmm. in, in, in some of the theoretical writing on um, horror, this writer John Clute uses this word vastation to describe the moment within horror texts, but also psychologically when we no longer see the world in the same way, when we're confronted with something so dreadful, but also fundamentally the true nature of the thing itself or our world itself, it lays to waste kind of our total understanding that previously existed and now we're forced to create a new understanding because the old concepts and definitions and, and rules and things that ordered our previous understanding, they no, no longer make sense. So in, in her just basic description of, of witnessing, you know, a, 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 poli- a, a, a broad daylight police murder so much worse than all the others, I could kind of hear in her voice how she all of a sudden viewed her life, her relationship to other people differently. And to me, that's tremendously powerful. It's also uh, something, you know, if it truly does happen, I would imagine it'd be, you know, really difficult to traverse and and uh, tangle with. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of the the real I'm trying to get at behind kind of our this world that we create, not just the police, um, but you know, our our system of living. All together, all the things that we do or don't do or deny so that we can live comfortably in, you know, in our own homes, but also in our own minds, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, trying to bob and weave around changing uh, climatic conditions, uh, a society of increasing um, cleavage, inequality, perhaps hostility. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but then also open violence that is, is, is used to secure these things, to keep things the way they are. That part to recognize that you're, you're kind of complicit in, in that system is, is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. I think there's also an aspect to this. I, I, I wanted to mention, which is in the last chapter, you, you talk about how you, I was waiting for it almost to kind of catch up to 2020, which was such a tumultuous year. Um, talking about how, you know, much of the book seemed to have been written prior to that yeah. last chapter. You're like, I'm <laughs> cloistered in my home or in my office. The pandemic is, is beginning. Um, you mentioned, of course, the, the murder of George Floyd, which again, obviously just, just so stark and so many people just saw exact, like, it's really difficult. Some people do this, but really difficult to deny the horror of that image of that situation. So I think there was a couple things where the, the systems as we have them as, as comfortable as they may be for many of us, um, were being challenged. I think the pandemic played a part in that. And then it sort of set the stage for when this extraordinary act of police violence occurred in broad daylight for all of us to see it almost was like the little thing it wasn't little, but the thing that pushed us collectively over the edge to where we were challenging, um, the legitimacy of the system. And people then grasp more hardly to the order, the order that they believe in, which is protected and defended by the police. So I, I, I just really wanted to um, kind of speak to that as like the more – it was such an interesting – interesting, such a non-word. The, the year of 2020 was such a, an experience for everybody. Um, people were holding on more tightly to the order as it was. And it was, it was where we started seeing situations like with, um, Rittenhouse vigilantes coming out of the woodwork to defend property, uh, like in Kenosha, which led of course to the, to the murder of three people, um, or two people, I think it was, sorry. I think three people were shot. Yeah. Uh, two. Yeah. Um, anyway, I just wanted to talk about this, Again, this this the sense where we do gaze into the real, the horror of what the liberal order is. People will <laughs> there. There's two ways we can interpret that. We can say, "Well, this is fucked. We shouldn't have this anymore," or right. we're like, "No, we want this. We have to protect this order by all costs." And so it can go in this other direction of of extrema, like fascist violence. Frankly, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's. I suppose we can have a continuum of of fascism and liberalism on on on, on, you know, mm -hmm. on the same on the same line. Um, yeah, it, it it makes sense whether you know whether you're somebody that's very much attuned to the police and educated and follow the police and maybe have personal experience. You know, I I I, I say somewhere in there that I'm not purporting to deliver some, uh, you know, uh, occulted knowledge that has escaped yeah. people. These, these things, like we know th this is what it is. Right. Um, and that's what makes it so difficult to get around. It's because we know it doesn't work. We know they're violent. We know that, you know, the entire police project under underneath the most banal traffic ticket, and the most serious crime is not the, th not the threat of violence, but the promise of violence, right? So we know, we know all these things. And even when we see them in their worst, right, we, we might be disgusted by it, but there is a trap that we can fall back into and recreate, you know, a system of security or a system of order through violence, because that's really all we have. That's all we've ever been offered. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, even police critics, uh, heavy police critics, this is the problem of reform, right? Um, at the end of the day, they want the same things that everybody else wants. They want uh, to live in a, you know, a secure environment, mm -hmm. to be secure in their, their body and in their home. Yeah. And to this point, the, we haven't devised uh, a system to security that isn't somehow in some way dependent on violence. So I, I, I mentioned, and these are just anecdotal, but th this is my questions about different, different groups that spring up as alternatives. 
So um, the uh, the Chaz uh, mm. sector of mm-hmm. Seattle, right? Autonomous zone created uh, as a radical alternative to the, the violence and coercion of police, but very quickly fell back to policing its own subjects with with violence and coercion, yeah. right? So we might think, okay, we could have done that better, perhaps. Um, there's a few other examples I, I give in the book, but, um, you know, the, the Panthers, for instance. And, and again, you know, I, I, de- I deliberated on using the, the Panthers as an example because mm-hmm. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an obviously, you know, an admirer. I think they're incredibly important, perhaps, perhaps the most important social movement to emerge in the United States in, you know, 100 years. Yeah, but certainly. You know, the, the Panthers formed in opposition to the violence of the of the Oakland and L.A. Police Department. Right. Yeah. Self armed self-protection. But, you know, reading the words of the Panthers, the Panthers themselves, after a while, they admit to policing themselves in a similar sort of way with violence and coercion. So I say those things not necessarily to critique, you know, Chaz, per se, or or the Panthers. I just I'm posing them as anecdotes to ask this question, you know, what, what, in what way can we get outside of this relationship with, right. you know, our desire for security on the one hand and the means that we we've imagined uh, to get there. And I, I think that that is, that is a horrifying dilemma uh, yeah. to some, to some, to some degree. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is something that, uh, I appreciate it about coming to the end of your book is you're like, I don't know how to, you know, like I mentioned, there's so many books written about police abolition and um, I, I, I believe in that very much um, as well. So to be frank about that and say that we don't know what it, I don't want to say that we don't know what it would be like to not have police. What would a world without police look like? Because I feel like, the span of human societies, cultures that have existed throughout human history, we've existed without police for the majority of that time. <laughs> so right. obviously that's true, but you know, I think we're so conditioned and, and exist so much within this context that like when movements spring up, like you mentioned the Chaz or, or the Panthers, I mean, yes, the, these dynamics are reproduced, you know, in movements that are directly confronting the legitimacy of the police are also reproducing the dynamics of policing within their ranks. And that is, um, what do you say to that? You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I think <laughs> toward, toward, I appreciate your comments about the end of it. Cause honestly, I didn't know how to end the book. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of ended it the same way I ended my last, my last book by, uh, by parroting, uh, James or borrowing some words from James Baldwin. And James Baldwin has the very famous quote from uh, A Fire This Time, where basically he says, you know, all the things, all the pain that we suffer as human beings, all the, the things that we do that we wish we couldn't do, all these things we do partially or at least maybe wholly uh, to deny the fact of our own death. Right. So death mm-hmm. is the ultimate insecurity. Mm-hmm. That's the thing we're running from constantly. Um, and so Baldwin says, you know, perhaps the only way outside of this is to face it and earn, earn our deaths by taking responsibility in his words for life, like for taking responsibility for our own lives, but the lives of other people. Um, and so that, that matches up very well with, you know, other writers and thinkers that I, I cited, uh, and, and draw drew upon earlier in the book, right. You know, these things that we do that vex us so much at the end of the day, it's insecurity, but the, the, you know, the ultimate insecurity, the, you know, the, the king of all terrors is, is death. And, yeah. um, the police don't offer a solution to death other than how to create more deaths. They, they don't, they don't offer us a great solution on how to protect life. Mm-hmm.